Hey guys, we are almost done with ears and eyes and we are halfway through ears. Um, we just have Meniere's, which is in the ears. Um, and then we have one more disorder after this. That's really quick. So um, Meniere's is probably the biggest disorder. It has like the most parts to it um, out of all the ear disorders. So this is the one that's going to, you know, kind of like glaucoma for the eyes like this is the bigger one now out of all the ear disorders lord i don't i don't really i haven't really seen a lot on like nclex style stuff but it's definitely possible to be tested over them and you will have questions like this on this exam if you um on the third exam for us if you are in uh, at my school for adult med surge so um this is the one i would say that uh is the most complex or you know there's a lot of different questions we can get from this so when we talked about otosclerosis last, um, that is a disorder that is just a hearing problem. Meniere's is one where there's a hearing issue, um, but more importantly, there's a vertigo issue. So there's hearing and, um, you know, like balance or loss of balance issues. Um, this is an inner ear disease. We talked about otosclerosis was just a... Um, it's the bone problem. It happens in young people. It's hereditary. Meniere's um, usually happens age um, six, uh, 40 to 60, like middle age. And this is actually changed from my other videos because I want to say it used to be like 30 to 50 maybe. I don't remember, but it was a different age range. Um, similar, but um, you know, still middle age, but just a little different. Um, either that or it was like 50 to 70. I can't remember, um, but it was a little bit different. Um, and um, it's not well understood why it happens, but what happens is that effectively, um, you have these chambers in your ear that have these, um, these fluid that, um, it's like a lymphatic system, and um, what happens is is that um, too much fluid accumulates, um, like you have this over, like it's either maybe your um this endolymphatic um sac is producing too much, or there's um other factors. It's not well understood, um, but what happens is is that you have this um these two fluids in the this chamber and I have a really good video over this which might not be in this PowerPoint but I just reminded me to add it um but um you know what happens is is that these two fluids um there's these two fluids in the sac and what happens is is that they fill up they get too much and they burst and they mix together and when they mix together it leads to like a severe vertigo um because like the when I talk about severe like some of these patients they cannot get out of bed they cannot move and sometimes for days um what eventually happens this chamber that ruptures it comes back together it heals and the fluids go where it's supposed to but for a period of days and they can have these attacks like you know multiple times a year and um, they can last for a week or longer sometimes it just depends um, and it just really uh, interferes with their ability to do their job to work to interact with life and um, it can lead to severe safety issues especially if they have attack um, and they're working like they could literally have um, a life-ending injury if they um, have an attack while they're like um, you know standing on a very tall building or you know depending on what kind of work they're doing or um, you know driving a car etc. So um, my priority assessments for a patient with Meniere's, you want to ask what symptoms they're experiencing. So you want to kind of look at what symptoms they have related to the vertigo. They might complain of like um, a dizziness. They might complain of ringing in their ears. They might complain of having a fall, a feeling of ear fullness. So you want to see what um, symptoms they're experiencing. Um, and then also do a hearing test because this can affect hearing as well. Um, like I said, the symptoms they usually experience are um, vertigo or feeling of um, disorientation, um, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, drop attacks, which is like where they literally just fall to the ground because they cannot hold themselves up, and then a feeling of fullness. Um, it's usually episodic, so it comes and goes, and it can last hours to days, occur several times a year. Um, and then the hearing loss that they experience can be gradual over time or it can fluctuate. Um, we usually have to rule out other possible causes of... Um, uh, what do you call it, Meniere's, um, you know, other things that might have, may have led them um, to having uh, Meniere's, um, or, uh, sorry, other things that may have led to their hearing loss, because there's a lot of the, uh, hearing loss and vertigo. When people have vertigo, it can either be a neurological cause, um, it can be a um, cardiac cause, or it could be a balance system cause. So we have to kind of rule out other causes that they might be having this for. And then we do what's called glycerol testing. Um, and what glycerol testing is, glycerol is a medication that 
um, <clears throat> leads to an absorption of fluids um, and it specifically helps pull fluid from the ear. And so if someone, um, glycerol is an oral um, uh, solution, I want to say, uh, it might be a tablet, but I want to say it's a solution. And if they, uh, pretty much a glycerol test is if they take glycerol during an acute attack and their symptoms improve, um, their hearing improves, um, their, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, maybe some of their other symptoms improve. Uh, like uh, really it should be mostly their hearing, but like, you know, um, if uh, other symptoms symptoms and stuff is proved as well. It's usually a sign that it has to be Meniere's just because it's showing that it's a fluid problem. Um, Cause like glycerol should pull the fluid from the ear. So if they take glycerol and their hearing improves and things like that, that's a sign, Hey, it has to be a fluid issue. It's a fluid issue. It's Meniere's. Um, so overall, medically, what we're trying to do for these patients is you want to think about there's two sides to their treatment. For Meniere's, there's the side where I'm treating like an acute problem, like decreasing um, an acute attack symptoms, because um, when they're having an acute attack, like they are down for the count, like they are not doing well. And then there's also... Um, the fact that I want to prevent or decrease attacks overall, like I want them to be having, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't want them to be having attacks as often, um, you know, and then, um, you know, like, like, so in other words, think of like acute attacks and then maintenance. Um, so when we're talking about medical treatment, like when they're having an acute attack, like I said, they're stuck in bed, they're very uncomfortable. So think of all of the, oh, and I didn't update this to make it all antis, but there's, um, there's really four or five anti-medications that we're going to use um, in order to help during an acute attack. And so I will say them as all antis just to help with the spirit that I was going for. So um, the medications that can help and all these medications help to either decrease the amount of fluid they have or decrease the amount of kind of dries them out or decreases the like imbalance or the dizziness or vertigo like symptoms. So antihistamines, anticholinergics, anti-anxiety should be there instead of benzodiazepines. Um, and then antiemetics and anti-inflammatories can be used too. But I would say the big four antihistamines, anticholinergics, benzos, or anti anxiety um, and anti-emetics. So we want them to stop them from throwing up. We want to um, decrease their anxiety because it can feel very nerve wracking when they're all over the place. Anticholinergics and antihistamines. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't, they don't need to take those all the time. They're only going to take them when they're having an acute attack or having symptoms because that's when they get the vertigo. They're not having vertigo all the time. These people could be out in the world and be fine for a while, but then they have these debilitating attacks um, that are very, very difficult to survive and again could lead to very serious issues. In between, um, we know we're going to do things to prevent attacks. So diuretics, antihistamines. So we're trying to stop water or fluids from building up. Antihistamines, if you remember, they also have anticholinergic properties, um, which help to decrease the amount of fluids that, um, you know, we're kind of holding on to. Um, so we're going to do things like that. Um, and then there are actual surgical options too. Now, these are more, you know, invasive and serious, um, but they can place a shunt in, which helps to drain. If the issue is, is, is that endolymphatic sac is um, draining or has too much fluid, they can put a shunt in um, in order to help to drain it. They can cut the nerve. Um, so the end endolymphatic nerve, um, if it's to the point where it's just like so debilitating, um, they're not, their, their life is just really falling apart and they can't, they're having tons of attacks and they can't deal with it. Um, they can cut the nerve. Now, when they cut that nerve, it's also going to, and I called a nerve, but the um, endolymphatic sac. Um, and because a student asked it in class this semester, um, but um, it's not a nerve, but it's like there's only one of them, and you have like it's it's the pretty much the king of all the um, the the lymphatic system in your ear. Um, and so there's one of those, so we can cut that. Um, now, if you cut that though, it also cuts off your hearing, and that might seem extreme, um, but some of these patients are so debilitated when they're sitting there and looking at like losing their hearing or being able to stand up straight, they choose being able to stand up straight. They can do ablations too, um, or inject into myosin. And this can also lead to hearing loss, but it can also just lead to that um, endolymphatic sac not putting out so much of the fluid that's leading to this um, over accumulation of fluid, etc. Ooh, application question. Let's do it. A nurse is caring for a client that is having an acute attack of their Meniere's disease. Which intervention is most important for the nurse to implement? So this is looking on the nurse's side of things. So during an acute attack, saying what's most important. So it's saying, I might do all of these things, but which one is going to have the best, um, most um, that's going to be most helpful? And remember, during an acute attack, because remember, there's those two periods. I'm helping them during an acute attack, and I'm helping to prevent attacks or long-term maintenance. So during an acute attack, do I really need to tell them low-sodium diet? 
hmm, you know, well, well, that might help them to accumulate less fluid. I, I just don't see that as like my ABC priority. I think a low sodium diet could help. So they're not accumulating as much fluid, but it doesn't seem as direct, like the most helpful thing. Um, encourage the client encourage the client to increase their fluid intake. Um, I definitely don't want to do that. That's like the opposite of what I want them to do. To, um, they, they already have too much fluid, so I do not want them having more. So I'm going to say no to that one. Um, have a low stimulation, safe environment. Um, I like this one because I know that like when you're having vertigo, like you're really overwhelmed and you're feeling like really lightheaded and dizzy and you don't want a lot of lights, noises, um, other things that are going to overstimulate your senses. So I like this one the best so far, um, but I don't know if it's the most important. So let's see. Um, perform serial hearing exams on the client. Um, so they could have changes to their hearing, um, but during an acute attack, I don't really know that checking their hearing constantly is going to be the most important thing. Um, during the acute attack, I'm really hyper-focused on making them comfortable and keeping them safe. And so the best way that I can do that is going to be C. So think of um, with Meniere's um, during that acute period is, is I want to keep them comfortable with all the anti-medicines, the four or five anti-medicines. Um, I want to keep a very low stimulating environment. I don't want, um, you know, they're not going to watch a lot of TV. They're, I'm going to need to help ambulate them if they, most of them are on strict bed rest. They don't even get out of bed. Um, and I just really want to keep them um, low stimulation, safe, dark room, that kind of stuff. So just to reiterate that during an acute attack, bed rest, quiet, dark room. Um, if they do are able to ambulate per doctor's order, provide for safety. Um, I don't want them to move their head stuff suddenly because head position changes actually is what signals our body. Um, uh, what do you call it? It can cause make vertigo a lot worse. Um, anytime I change my head position, my body, my ears and stuff are using the balance system to adjust. So I don't want to do any of that suddenly. Um, fluorescent flickering lights, like stuff like TV, we usually want to stay away from that. I'm going to monitor their eyes and nose, do a daily weight, um, fall precautions. We already talked about helping with ambulation. Um, and then nausea, vomiting interventions, which is why I have this emesis basin here. Um, so we want to pretty much stop them from um, getting sick um, long term. Um, so this is kind of the other part of things. So like in between attacks, this is the low sodium diet is a great intervention, but it's more for long term maintenance. Like if someone's sitting there and they can barely sit up straight, I'm not going to be like, let me teach you about this low sodium diet. Like, is it important? Yes, but it's not important when they can't even stand up straight. Um, so I'm going to enforce it at a later date. Um, so because pretty much low sodium, um, a low sodium diet helps to stop accumulating so much. But if I'm already at an acute attack, um, that that um, endolymph, uh, you know, structure has burst. Um, a low sodium diet is not going to help me at that point. Um, it's going to help me in between to prevent an attack. But right now, it's not going to stop the fact that um, my chamber has burst and, you know, my um, I've lost all my balance. Um, your book also talks about avoiding other triggers like caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol can make it worse. So pretty pretty much can't smoke, can't drink, and can't stay awake. I'm just joking. It's not that extreme. Um, but um, these are three major triggers you want to avoid. A good medication education for these patients. Um, now, you guys are not responsible to know crazy in depth when it comes to um, all those anti-meds, but just know what the anti-meds are and then just know that they're also, um, you know, you already learned about loop diuretics. So just being aware of that. Um, and then you want to tell them to avoid swimming or high, uh, high places like high altitude places during acute attacks. And then um, they can also do like I heard like your book said something about like ear exercises or something, but I think it's more like balance exercises. Um, those can also help in between as well to um, support a healthy balance system. So yeah, that's it for Meniere's. I'll see you for the last one. Bye.